السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد um, I think the author might come to these ahadith later but I remind of the hadith of Abu Hurairah narrated by Bukhari and Muslim in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said مَنْ أَكَلَ مِنْ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ فَلَا يَقْرَبَنَّ مَسْجِدَنَا يُؤْذِينَا بِرِيحِ الثُّومِ Whoever eats from this plant or tree, garlic, shouldn't come near the masjid and harm people with, with that smell. And in another narration he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam حَتَّى يَذْهَبَ رِيحُهَا Until that bad smell goes. And that applies to all scents that are not pleasant and that harm other people. So if somebody's just had a cigarette, then they shouldn't go into the masjid straight after and pray salah. Till they're confident that that smell's completely gone. Or if a person knows of themselves that uh, something about them isn't smelling uh, good, they shouldn't enter the masjid in the first place. Even if they hear the adhan, even if they hear the iqama, they don't enter the masjid because there's an explicit prohibition of the, on that. And in that case, praying at home is better for that person because uh, avoiding wider harm is, is more important. The author might touch upon these hadith later. Anyway, <coughs> these, two, these hadith are in Bukhari and Muslim, uh, but I don't remember whether the author mentions them in his book or not. We got to the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar. Anhuma, in which the Prophet وسلم, said إِذَا اسْتَأْذَنَتْ أَحَدَكُمْ امْرَأَتُهُ إِلَى المسجد فَلَا يَمْنَعْهَا if, a, if your woman normally the word woman امرأة means wife in this, in this context but it can apply to a wider um, uh, it, can, it can apply more widely women that a man generally has responsibility over whether that be a daughter, younger sister and that kind of thing so here the Prophet وسلم, says if, if women seek permission to go to the masjid then don't prevent them from going to the masjid um, who's narrating this hadith? Abdullah ibn Umar yeah? فَقَالَ بِلَالُ بْنُ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ One of Abdullah ibn Umar's sons, Bilal, said, وَاللَّهِ لَنَمْنَعْهُنْ وَاللَّهِ I'm going to stop them from going. There's no way I'm going to allow my wife or you know, women to go to the masjid. So Abdullah ibn Umar got very angry when he heard his son say that. It says here, فَسَبَّهُ سَبَّنْ سَيِّئًا he cursed him badly and insulted him. مَا سَمِعْتُهُ سَبَّهُ مِثْلَهُ قط. I've never heard him swear like that before. I've never heard him insult or someone like that before. Is the word swear too, too heavy? That's what it means. Sub is to insult or to swear at someone. وَقَالْ And Abdullah ibn Umar and that swearing doesn't mean necessarily it was very foul language or it just means he insulted him harshly. So Abdullah ibn Umar, after insulting his son, said, Rasulillah I just tell you that the Messenger of Allah says this, and you say I'm gonna stop them. Just as I tell you the Prophet said this, you say I'm gonna do the opposite. In another narration he says. Don't talk to me again. I won't speak to you again. Because Abdullah ibn Umar and his father were very, very strict on opposing the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, especially so immediately after you've just heard a, a hadith. And that's why any time a person hears a statement attributed to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, our first reaction should be acceptance or genuine Questions of understanding. 
Because we can't accept everyone's claim of a hadith. Someone might be claiming, attributing something to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's a false hadith. Okay. So, but our first reaction should be one of acceptance or genuine questioning. What does this hadith mean? How do we apply this hadith? Uh, and so on. Not one of rejection. And he says in another narration, لا تمنعوا إماء الله مساجد الله Do not prevent women from going to the masajid. We've said before in Usul al-Fiqh that if the Prophet ﷺ prohibits something, the general rule is that thing is considered what? Haram. Prohibited, sinful. And therefore, taking this hadith, we understand from it that Preventing women from going to the masajid is impermissible. Impermissible. That's a general rule, general principle laid down by the Prophet ﷺ. Did women, does this hadith apply to all five prayers or just some of them? Daytime, for example, or dhuhr, or, or what? All five. All five. Did women used to attend Isha? Women used to attend Isha. In Al Bukhari a Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ explicitly said, if a woman seeks permission to attend Salat al Isha, then don't prevent her. And that's because women are more likely to be prevented from going out at night than they are during the day. So the Prophet ﷺ specifically pointed out, even at night, don't prevent them from going. Could some harm come out of women going out at night? Okay, and that means that this Sharia is not built upon. Preventing anything that seems like it may lead to harm. But the Sharia is built upon weighing between good and harm and giving priority to what's better. And here, the priority is that women attend the masajid because masajid are places of increasing iman, masajid are places of learning and seeking knowledge, masajid are places of getting to know people of salah, which means people of righteousness, which means good families good friends, good companionship, these benefits far outweigh the possible harms that may come out of women leaving the house, women going out at night, women being in the same uh, you know, facilities, same masjid as, as men and so on. These are possible harms, but the benefits outweigh them. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ emphasized this issue. In the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, with a good isnad, it's narrated that Umar ibn Khattab's wife um, who, and her name was Atika. Umar's wife is called Atika. She used to attend the masjid and some people, some people said to her, you know that Umar doesn't like you going to the masjid. So why do you still, still insist on going? So Atika said, if he tells me not to go, I'll stop going. If he tells me not to go, I'll stop going. And she said this to Umar. She said, if you stop me from going to the masjid, I won't go. I'll listen to you. So Umar will stay silent. Because he knows the Prophet ﷺ prohibited men from preventing their wives going to the masjid. And that's a natural inclination of a man. He doesn't want their wife to always be out. Certainly not five times a day, consistently going to the masjid and, and so on. Uh, we saw in the hadith of Aisha, one of the first hadith in the chapter of Salah, that women used to attend Fajr also with the Prophet ﷺ in the masjid. Which is very rare practice today in any all Muslim countries. Okay, let alone here, that women go to uh, attend Fajr. Very rare practice. But it was done in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It doesn't mean that all women attended, but certainly some women attended. Um, in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, placed a restriction on women, however, and that is wearing perfume. And he said in the hadith of Zainab, the wife of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, she narrates that the Prophet وسلم, said to us, If any of you goes out to pray, then don't wear perfume. فَلَا تَمَسَّ طِيبًا if any woman goes out to pray, then don't wear perfume. And in another hadith, hadith Abu Hurairah, he said, If women want to go to pray in the masjid, then let them go, 
but go unperfumed. Go unperfumed. Uh, so that's an important condition. Because wearing perfume and going out has become widespread practice amongst Muslim women. And doing so is sinful. Going out perfumed is sinful for a woman. It's prohibited. Explicitly prohibited in the Sunnah. If that woman is going to be in the presence of other men, if she's confident that she won't be in the presence of other men, then it's okay. Because the Sunnah makes clear the reason for prohibition is that other men uh, are present and then are impacted by that smell. Okay? It's narrated by Tirmidhi and others. So if a woman is going to a relative's house, only women, and from the house straight to the car, to, to their house, or to a wedding, okay, and she puts perfume in the, in the car, for example, on herself, and then goes into the wedding hall, it's okay. If she's going to be in the presence of women only, or maharim, it, it doesn't mean literally outside the house it becomes haram. It, what, what outside the house means in the presence of other men. Because if she was in her house and she knew she was going to be in a gathering of non-mahram men, is she allowed to use perfume or not? No. So what, what, what's meant by the ahadith that talk about women wearing perfume outside the house is in the presence of other men. Whether that's in your house or whether that be, whether that be outside. So that ruling is made clear. And similar to, similar to perfume is excessive beautification because it takes the same ruling. The whole point of prohibiting women from perfume is that it's attractive zina. It's attractive and distractive zina or distracting. So the same applies to excessively being beautified, especially if hijab is not even fulfilled in terms of conditions. So that's uh, you know, another restriction. If a woman's going to go to the masjid, then these conditions should be, should be upheld. Allah um, Taib, that's that. Who had something on that? It's okay. It's been explained. Is it only specific to the masjid? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, with regards to women going to the masjid, uh, I think there's another hadith about it being better for them to pray at home. How do you reconcile those two? Yeah. So we have two um, kinds of hadith that we want to talk about now. And that's what I was going to move on to next. The first is the hadith of Aisha in Sahih al-Bukhari. In which she said, Had the Prophet wasallam seen what women do today, he would have stopped them from going to the masjid. Okay. Um, that's the first hadith. The second type of hadith are hadith that talk about a woman's prayer in her house being better than her prayer in the masjid. We'll deal with those in a second. We'll talk about those hadith in a second. But first this hadith of Aisha. Some ulama have used it to say, we are now in a time in which women should not attend the masjid. Okay, so women going to the masjid was in the time of the messenger, alayhi salatu when people's iman was high and hearts were pure, and if Aisha says things have gotten bad in our time and that's only within 45 to 50 years after the death of the Prophet If Aisha is saying if the messengers had seen what women have done today he would have stopped them from going to the masajid. Number one, the statement of Aisha does not override the command that's explicit of the Prophet That's the first thing. Secondly, we already have in the Sunnah the requirement of going unperfumed. And it seems like, a number of ulama have mentioned, it seems like what Aisha was referring to is women's beautification, including perfume. And that was already prohibited. Okay. So that already was a requirement. Now, if people do something that is halal, in a way that is haram, we don't make the whole thing haram. We keep the thing that's halal, halal, and the thing that's haram, haram. Yeah? What's halal remains halal, and what's haram is, is ruled to be haram. But maybe we might just emphasize and warn specifically against doing that thing that's haram. So the solution 
to women wearing perfume, for example, is not to prevent women from going to the masjid because the Prophet ﷺ is a legislator for all of mankind through, until the end of time. So if his sunnah applies only for 10 years and then we're going to go against it for 1500 years, that's problematic because his sunnah is therefore for eternity. And if he knew that the ruling was going to change, he would have, would have made, that, made that clear or clarified it. So the solution isn't really to prevent women from going to the masjid because we have so many benefits that come from women going to the masjid. And if women struggle to wear hijab, and women struggle to have good friends, and women are not educated, and women are not able to teach their children the basics of Islam, a lot of that goes back to not having good facilities for women to, to learn and to increase their iman. Because it's not fair to expect that our wives are at the same level as iman as us when they have no opportunities and we have the opportunities. We attend Jumu'ah Salah in the masjid every day. We attend Duroos if guests come. We attend with them. We sit with them. We ask them questions. And they get none of that. And on top of that, they, they can't access the, the masjid as well. So that's important. And there's a huge difference between attending a class in the masjid and listening to, to the content online. If they were equal, then no one should be in this masjid. Zahid Fatah is the best speaker in the world. There's plenty of things online. There's plenty of things online, you know, more beneficial, better people, more knowledgeable. But just us being gathered in the masjid increases our iman. Even if, you know, what I have to say is, is not useful. Or barely useful. So, uh, that's also not an excuse to say women don't have to attend the masjid anymore. Because they have plenty of access online to listen to beneficial knowledge and, and so on. No, the masjid has a specific and distinct barakah and blessing that raises people. So we want to make sure that that's, that's something that's done. So really, the fatwa pro prohibiting women from going to the masjid is against the sunnah. And yes, some ulama have, have held that view throughout history, but it's against the sunnah. And there's no you know, really strong argument to, to say otherwise. And Ibn Hazm rahimahullah, has an essay in which he strongly defends you know, these ahadith and and response to those ulama who, who said otherwise. Yeah. Question here and then here. Um, so in regards to that, then there's, I don't know about a lot of countries, but I know at least in Afghanistan and Pakistan, maybe other Asian countries, no massage actually have the cities for women. Yeah. That Which is a problem. That. Which is a problem. We ha I haven't heard in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a masjid only for men. I haven't heard of that. And it's a problem. They're using a different, different hadith to justify it? The best, the, the best argument I've heard is this hadith of Aisha that I've just mentioned. Had the messenger seen what women do. But that's not really, uh, that's not the way to go about things. And that's why, you know, the standard of iman and religiosity and, and knowledge decreases. Women are half of the ummah. They're the ones who spend most of the time with, with our children when they're young, especially. So the level of their Iman is going to impact the level of Iman and the knowledge of the next generation. That's a very bad innovation. That Masajid don't have scope for women. Some people find it too hard, too burdensome for a woman to step inside the Masjid. And that's also an innovation. Women were inside the Masjid with no issue in the time of the Prophet yeah. How did you set the in this field? Yeah. So the dhara means, means to block the means, okay? Something is technically halal, but you prevent it because it's going to lead to, to greater harm. This principle is correct as a, in principle, but it's problematic in application a lot of the time. Because people differ on how, how to apply. People are also different in terms of their sensitivities. Some people are sensitive over a very small fault. So they want to, for example, you know, make it haram completely for a woman to step out of the house. Some fuqaha went as far as saying, a woman shouldn't step out of the house except three times in her life. And I won't mention, you know, when those three times are. <coughs> what kind of fiqh is that? Yeah. That kind of blocking the means is excessive use of this principle just in case something happens. 
just in case is not a, a, a shari principle. I mentioned before that the Prophet ﷺ noticed that women were behind the men and that the aura of the men may become uncovered when going into sujood and so on. What was his solution? Huh? Stay for exactly. He didn't stop women from going to the masjid. He simply said to women, لا ترفعوا رؤوسكم حتى يستوي رجال جلوسا. Don't raise your heads till the men sit up. That's it. We can't control people's hearts. We can't control people's hearts. In the time of the Sahaba, were there men that looked at women? Yes or no? Yes. And yet the solution wasn't to wasn't to close the door and, uh, you, you know, completely. Islam is a real, realistic religion. It's a realistic religion. Solutions are provided in a way which are suitable and appropriate. In the time of Umar ibn Khattab, when he saw that men and women started to get a lot and they were going through the same door, there's, khil- there's debate amongst ulama. Was this the Prophet ﷺ himself or was it Umar? And a lot of the ulama authenticate the narrations that it was actually Umar that opened up a second door, a separate entrance for the women. That means for many years, men and women are going through the same entrance. And that didn't need much of a solution because there wasn't a a huge issue. If something happens once or twice or someone spots a man looking at a woman or a woman looking at a man, that doesn't warrant changing rulings for the sake of that kind of thing. But it simply is a reminder. Guys give space for the women to, to do so. And in fact the Prophet ﷺ said that explicitly. He told, the women, he told the men to stay behind after Salah. He said, don't leave straight away, wait for a little bit. As Zuhri, one of the tabi'een says, I think he said that so that the women could leave first. So that they're not squeezing each other in, but you know, by the entrance and pushing and shoving. And then, you know, so the principle of blocking the means is a correct one. But it, it, it also has uh, a methodology in terms of application. And it's not one that can be applied rashly. Anytime something goes wrong, let's just stop this from happening altogether. Because there is benefit from women being in the masjid. So we don't take away all of that benefit over, you know, over a possible error. Also, Aisha said this because she was annoyed at women or some of the women at the time. Did she give the fatwa that it was haram for women to go to the masjid? She didn't. She herself used to still go. She herself used to still go. And the wife of Umar al-Khattab was in the masjid when he was killed in Fajr. Radiallahu anhu. So, uh, you know, the same is, is to be said for today. Wallahu anhu. Who else had that? Oh, you, uh, you already asked that. Yeah. So that's the hadith of Aisha uh, on that. The third type of ahadith are those ahadith that talk about prayer in a woman's house being better than prayer in the masjid. Um, to be honest, most of the ulama have taken with these hadith, and that's why most of the fuqaha of the former dahib are of the view that a woman's prayer in her house is better than her prayer in the masjid. Abu Dawood narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said, Don't prevent women from going to the masajid. But their homes are better for them. The only problem with this narration is that the most authentic narrations don't mention this addition. This hadith is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. But Bukhari and Muslim don't mention this addition of their homes are better for them. It's narrated by Abu Dawood in his Sunan. It's narrated by Imam Ahmad as well in his Musnad. And a few other ulama too. Um, and normally, if a Bukhari and Muslim leave out an important addition in a hadith, it's for a reason. Because al Bukhari and Muslim are books of fiqh. They are there to lay down the hadith that give rulings. So, if they leave out an important addition like this, it usually indicates towards some defect in the hadith. And that's what a lot of the muhaddithin believe, that this addition is a, is a defective addition. Um, in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ was asked by a woman about praying inside the masjid with him. So he said, I know that you like to pray 
with me inside the masjid. But your prayer at home is better for you. Your prayer at home is better for you. And uh, this hadith also is open for discussion in terms of uh, hadith authenticity. I haven't looked into it in detail, to be honest, to be able to say, uh, you know, with confidence uh, what most of the muhaddithin say. Um, but it's something to look into. Um, but again, it's not narrated by either al-Bukhari or Muslim. And just because al-Bukhari and Muslim don't mention a hadith, it doesn't mean it's weak automatically. But if it's a hadith containing an important ruling and they don't mention it, it means it usually needs further investigation. Because there's possibly a reason for that. That's why Ibn Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala says, rarely do al-Bukhari and Muslim leave out a hadith which contains an important ruling, except that that hadith has some kind of some kind of question marks over it, because they require, you know, a high level of authenticity. Also, if uh, you know, salah in the homes was always uh, better for women, then it would be something that the Prophet sallallahu you know, reinforced to women in more authentic hadith than the hadith that we have. Especially because women are attending salah every single day in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, Allahu alam, you know, uh, there is some uh, debate on on this issue, and it can be explored further. You know, the strength of the hadith on the topic, um, but nonetheless, you know, it could be something that goes back to a woman's circumstances as well and her responsibilities. If a woman has responsibilities at home more important then that takes precedence over salah in the masjid because salah in the masjid is no more than recommended for a woman at most it's not more than that certainly not wajib and it may not even be that strongly recommended either it may just be slightly recommended or permissible so it could be that different women had different circumstances those women that had more important responsibilities were encouraged by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to pray at home. And those women that didn't have other great responsibilities and had you know, regular access to the masjid with no compromise, used to attend the masjid regularly. And alhamdulillah, sahabiyat did, you know, did both. Right, are we done with this hadith? Next is also the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar. And now the author moves on to a new section altogether. And that is voluntary prayers. Voluntary prayers. He only mentions two ahadith, even though we have tens of ahadith on voluntary prayers. The first hadith is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar. Anhumah. He said, Sallaytu ma Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I prayed the following prayers with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another narration, he said, Hafidhtu an Rasulillah. These are the ten rak'ahs that I've memorized and noticed the Prophet ﷺ praying consistently. He says, two rak'ahs before dhuhr, two rak'ahs after dhuhr, two rak'ahs after Jumu'ah. This is this narration. Two rak'ahs after Maghrib and two rak'ahs after Isha. In another narration, he says, instead of two rak'ahs after Jumu'ah, two rak'ahs before Fajr. So Abdullah ibn Umar is saying, the ten consistent rak'ahs that I noticed the Prophet ﷺ praying are these. Two before Fajr, two before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, two after Isha. Okay. Um, in the following narration, he talks about, uh, he says, and Hafsa told me, who's Hafsa in relation to Ibn Umar? His sister, yeah. He says, Hafsa told me, and who else is she? Huh? She's the wife of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, yeah. So he says, Hafsa told me that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, used to pray two light rak'ahs, not long, not lengthy, two light rak'ahs before Fajr. And I wouldn't be at his house at that time, so I didn't see him do them, but Hafsa told me about them. 
And that's further supported by the following hadith of Aisha, in which she says, There is no sunnah prayer that the Prophet ﷺ was more consistent on than the two rak'ahs before Fajr. And finally, in Sahih Muslim, also in the hadith of Aisha, the Prophet ﷺ said, Rak'ata al Fajri khayru min al dunya wa mafiha. The two rak'ahs of Fajr are better than this whole world and everything that's in it. Every time we get too attached to, you know, to something in the world, it's good to remember this hadith. Money or a job or anything to do with the dunya. Two rak'ahs of Fajr are superior and greater than everything that's in the dunya. None of us is going to get everything in the dunya. If you're a billionaire, have you got everything? It's a lot more that you don't have. If you're a trillionaire, have you got everything? There's still more that you don't, more that you don't have than what you do have. Let alone the things that me and you are chasing after. A car or a house or some money or this or that. Two rakahs of Fajr are superior. Now, we have other authentic hadith that talk about voluntary prayers across the day. Who could mention some? <coughs> Uh-huh. According to the Hanabila, these are the Rawatib, the ten. And according to some ulama, like Ibn Taymiyyah, the Rawatib are twelve. And that's taken from a hadith of Um Habiba, in which she said that the Prophet وسلم, said, Whoever prays twelve voluntary prayers in a day. Allah Ta'ala will build for them a house, a home in Jannah. And having a home built for you in Jannah implies what? You go into Jannah. <laughs> it will be a house that's, that's empty. So it implies, you know, having a home built for you in Jannah implies that you're going to Jannah. That's 12 rak'ahs. What are these 12 rak'ahs? It's the 10 that we just mentioned plus. Two extra before Dhuhr, making it two before Fajr, two before, uh, four before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, two after Isha. In Sahih al-Bukhari and the Muslim, Aisha radiallahu anha says, four rak'ahs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to pray consistently before Dhuhr. Four rak'ahs before Dhuhr. Is there contradiction in these ahadith? No, because every companion is talking about what he saw or she saw. Ibn Umar said, I saw ten rak'ahs. Aisha is saying, my, the Prophet used to consistently pray four rak'ahs before the whole. And in another narration she said, in Muslim, she said he would pray four rak'ahs before Dhuhr in my house and then go to the masjid and pray Dhuhr. So that's twelve consistent rak'ahs that the Prophet ﷺ used to pray, or at least encourage. Is there anything else? Okay, good. Salat al-Duha, which the Prophet ﷺ used to sometimes pray, and it wasn't something that he prayed every single day, but it was something that he prayed several times. In fact, Aisha says, I haven't seen the Prophet ﷺ pray Duha ever. And what she means by never is rarely. Why does never mean rarely? Am I making that up? Because it sounds like it, unless there's some proof. How can we decide that never means rarely? Never means never. Ma ra'aytuhu sallaha qat. I've never seen him ever pray them. How can we how can we interpret that or translate that as being rarely? Okay, good. So she never saw it, but other companions definitely did. That's for sure. But even more than that, she herself narrates the Prophet ﷺ praying Salat al duha And both narrations are authentic. And that shows that the Arabs sometimes use that kind of gen you know, generality and, and, and broadness in, in speech. And we sometimes use it as well. You're never on time. You may have been on time sometimes. But it's a form of exaggeration. And it's still correct in speech. And so that's how, that's how 
Obviously, if we didn't have these other narrations, we would have assumed that Aisha literally never saw him pray them. And that's the, once again the importance of doing what? <coughs> of doing what? <coughs> yeah, Ali. Huh? <coughs> exactly, co- compiling the ahadith and, and reading them together. Not reading a hadith individually. I'm not saying that you do that, I'm just <laughs> saying because we spoke about his last list. Yeah. So, uh, Salat al Duha, the most reported from the Prophet وسلم, is eight rakats. And the least reported is two. And he said, وسلم, as a Muslim, each one of us owes a sadaqa on their on their joints, yeah? On their joints. He said 360 joints and we owe a sadaqa on every single one. And then he gave us different ways which we can make sadaqa to say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu akbar, astaghfirullah and so on. And he says, and you can complete your sadaqa, give the full sadaqa by praying two rak'ahs of duha. In another hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, Allah Ta'ala says, Son of Adam, if you pray four rak'ahs at the beginning of the day, I will take care of the end of the day. So it's an excellent way to start off our day. Especially if we sleep after Fajr and then wake up again. A good way to start the day is to remember Allah, morning adhkar, and to pray four rak'ahs to start the day. Because Allah Ta'ala will take care of us the rest of the day. By putting barakah in the rest of our day and productivity in our time and health and, and, and deeds. So that's Salat al duha We have the night prayer, which the author is going to talk about separately. Because that's a long discussion. Any other nafila prayers connected to the five daily, before or after? Uh, Shuruq is no different from Salat al duha yeah, Some ulama, you know, some shaykh may have used the word shuruq to talk about uh, you know, sitting down after Fajr for a period of time and then praying. But that prayer is just duha. It's no different. It's just that uh, sitting after, the, after Salah and then praying duha has its own virtue because you're staying in your masjid and uh, staying in your seat. And we mentioned this hadith last week about staying in your seat after Salah and the angels making dua for that person. Anything else connected to the five daily prayers? Before Asr, good. What? Okay, good. Uh, in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, the Prophet وسلم, said, May Allah have mercy on the one who prays four rak'ahs before Asr. Rahim Allah umra'an salla qabla al-Asr arba'ah. Four rak'ahs, by the way, can be prayed together. Or they can be prayed two, two, separate. Both are fine. It's the night prayer that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged praying in twos. And he said, Salatul Layli, Mathna, Mathna. The night prayer should be prayed in twos, twos. And in the hadith of Ali, the Prophet ﷺ himself used to regularly pray four rak'ahs before Asr. Now it's not as emphasized as these other prayers we've mentioned, but it's still something that he would sometimes do. Yeah. Both. You can pray them two or two, uh, two uh, splitting them, or you can pray them together. There's no harm in, in doing either of them. And, uh, you know, Imam Ahmad used to prefer praying them in twos. And it's Haq ibn Ahawi used to say, you can pray in twos or fours. The issue is quite flexible because the sunnah doesn't, doesn't restrict or specify. Yeah. In between. <coughs> yeah, good. Uh, the Prophet wasallam said, "Bayna kulli adhanini, salah." There is a prayer between every two adhans. What are the two adhans? The, the adhan itself and the iqama. The iqama is sometimes called an adhan. Okay, so it's recommended to pray between the adhan and the iqama, and that applies to every prayer generally. Okay, it's a, a nafila, it's a general nafila. It even applies to Maghrib. And the Sahaba used to pray uh, two rak'ahs between the Adhan of Maghrib and Salat al Maghrib. And 
It's not something that the Prophet ﷺ used to pray himself consistently, but it's something that many of the Sahaba did. And he allowed it explicitly, alayhi salatu wasalam. So after the Adhan of Maghrib, there's no harm in staying seated until the, until the Iqamah, and there's no harm in standing up and praying to rakats. It's not a consistent sunnah, but it's a, uh, something that's permissible to do. Yeah. Um, can I pray uh, uh, the salat, salat before Zuhr with the um, two rakats of Baila? Yes. Uh, this prayer between two, each, uh, you know, the two adhans is a bit like what we said about Tahiyyat al-Masjid. It's just about filling our time with prayer. It's not that they are specific prayers with a specific name or uh, anything like that. So therefore, if someone walks into the masjid after Fajr, they can pray the two rak'ahs of Fajr with the intention that they're praying between the two adhans, with the intention that they're praying when walking into the masjid before sitting, and with the intention of, of the sunnah of Fajr. However, can you walk into the masjid before Dhuhr and say, these are my two rak'ahs before Dhuhr and my two rak'ahs before Fajr that I missed? Can you do that? No, because each one is an independent prayer. So if, if a prayer is independent, you can't put them together. You can't put them together. And if a prayer is not independent, but it's just there for the purpose of filling that time with prayer, then there's no harm in mixing intentions. How do we know it's this or that? Because the Prophet ﷺ will specify. If he says, for example, the two rak'ahs of Fajr are better than the dunya and what's in it, we know that these are two independent, distinct prayers. But if he says, if you enter the masjid, don't sit down till you pray two rak'ahs, that's not an independent prayer. It just means don't sit down till you pray two rak'ahs. Any two rak'ahs. Yeah? If he says, teaching us salatul istikhara, whoever wants to do something or embark on something, they should pray two voluntary prayers, not obligatory prayers, and then make this dua. Allahumma inni yastakhiruka bi ilmika wa astakhiruka bi qudratik dua al-istikhara. Is the prayer of istikhara an independent prayer? No, it's not. Okay? It's not a, an independent prayer called the prayer of istikhara. You can do it at the sunnah of fajr. You can do it at the sunnah of dhuhr, the sunnah after maghrib. There's no harm in doing it. And if there's, it's none of those prayers, you can just pray two extra voluntary prayers. There's no harm in that as well. Yeah, so the same is said for that. The same is said for the two rak'ahs after making wudu. These are not independent, distinct prayers. Allah Yeah. I've heard of another Allah Alaihi Wasallam. I'm not sure. Mention the hadith and. Yeah, four before Dhuhr and four after. Uh, four before Dhuhr and four after Dhuhr. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, is narrated in the hadith of Aisha, um, but I don't remember its authenticity now. We can check it inshallah after. Yeah. What's this? Yeah, the morning, I mean the morning adhkar. Um, look, the morning adhkar, the Prophet وسلم, did not specify that time in a single hadith. Which is why ulama differ, okay, up to when can you read your morning adhkar? According to Sheikh Mansur Buhuti, one of the fuqah of the Hanabila and other ulama, you can read your morning adhkar all the way up until dhuhr. And at the end of the day, it's a dhikr or a dua. So therefore, there's no need to be too restrictive unless the Prophet wasallam restricted. Someone wakes up, let's say, at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 a.m., okay, or p.m., whatever it is, dhuhr time. Uh, they wake up before Dhuhr and they remember to say their morning adhkar. Say the morning adhkar. Alhamdulillah. In fact, 
if someone wants to say a morning dhikr in the evening or afternoon or any random time, it's dhikr, it's dua, there's no harm in saying it. We have preferred time, which is the morning and evening for evening adhkar. Same is to be said about the evening. Ulama differ whether the evening begins after Asr or after Maghrib. But again, it's a flexible thing. It's a flexible thing. If a person you know, remembers after Asr, great. If a person doesn't remember till after Maghrib or just before they sleep, it doesn't matter. These are adhkar. This is a kind of dua, it's remembering Allah. And it's included in the general wording of the Prophet ﷺ, which is Amsa. Okay? Which means just the masa, the evening. And the evening is quite a broad term. Same with morning, the morning is quite a, a broad term as well. Wallahu um, That's that in terms of nawafil. Anything else? If you miss the uh, <coughs> can you repeat? Yeah, good question. Any hadith that you remember on this? We mentioned one last week. Yeah, which is problematic, you know, that we're going to use that as an evidence because we said last week that you shouldn't pray in Sunnah after Asr. And that's why, uh, you know, most of the imma believe that to be specific to the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Praying the Sunnah after Asr specifically. But we can still take from it a general rule. We can still take from it a general rule. And that is that if you miss a voluntary prayer, you can make it up at another time. Why did we take from this hadith part of it and not the other part? It's one hadith. In it, the Prophet ﷺ said, when questioned, why did you pray two rak'ahs after Asr? He said, these are the two rak'ahs after Dhuhr. I missed them after Dhuhr because I was just... Dis- Occupied with something. Why did we say you can pray voluntary prayers, make them up at later times, but not after Asr specifically? Why did we take part of the hadith and not the other part of it? Because huh? of Yeah. Exactly. Because there's specific prohibition on this, and there's no specific prohibition on that. So we still stick to the general rule that anything the Prophet ﷺ does is a sunnah. But where we have specific prohibition, that's where we, we stick to the, that specific, specific prohibition. And I spoke at length last week about why, you know, why the view of most of the Sahaba is that you shouldn't pray sunnah prayers after Fajr or after Asr. Now is not the time to, you know, repeat that. Yeah, what about it? Prohibition was on Friday. So Friday. Yeah. But you can fast on a Friday. You should yeah. fast on these kind of Yeah, good. Exactly. Similar. Exactly. Similar. You know, we, uh, where there's a general permissibility, we keep to the general permissibility. And if there's a specific prohibition or discouragement, then we have that specific discouragement. Yeah, good. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, what's the correct opinion on someone connected to Jumatra? Yes, yeah, a good question. And uh, we have this hadith that's um, the Prophet ﷺ prayed two rak'ahs after Jumu'ah. And it seems like those two rak'ahs were in the masjid. Because Ibn Umar is talking about witnessing him doing it regularly. And it's also authentically narrated that he prayed four rak'ahs after Jumu'ah at home. So. Uh, it's hard to say that it's either two or it's either four. Different ulama have different ways of dealing with it. Ibn Taymiyyah tries to reconcile and say, if you pray in the masjid, you pray two. If you pray at home, you pray four. Maybe. Okay, maybe. That's one way of dealing with it. But it just seems like there's general flexibility on praying. Praying voluntary prayers after Salat al-Jum'ah. Uh, that can be two rak'ahs, four rak'ahs. Um, there's nothing set that I know of, Allah alam. If someone knows of something set, they can let us know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, before there's nothing set. In fact, the sound of hadith imply that it's open. And the Prophet wasallam says, whoever goes to the Jumu'ah prayer early and purifies themselves and makes ghusr and applies perfume and this and that, وَصَلَّى مَا قُدِّرَ له, And then prays whatever Allah decrees for them. He will have such and such reward. Pray whatever Allah decrees for them means what? 
2, 4, 6, 10, 20, it doesn't matter. So again, um, the Hanabida don't stipulate, or at least many fuqaha don't stipulate a specific number before Jumu'ah. Allahu A'la. What's the difference between the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his action? Does one imply something different from the other? Action implies uh, sunnah. Yeah. Action implies sunnah. And command and statement? So which one would you say has more emphasis? The statement or the practice? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good. What were you going to say? Same thing, yeah. So the statement or the direction of the Prophet ﷺ, his command, takes precedence. Why? Because a general command to the Ummah can't be interpreted any other way. It can't, you can't make an exception to it or say that this only applies in, in a certain case. It's a general command. Okay? It's a general command. But if the Prophet ﷺ does something, it's not clear necessarily that that's obligatory, recommended, or it's an exception to the rule, or it's a one-off. It also doesn't imply specific recommendation in number. If the Prophet ﷺ recommends verbally to pray two rak'ahs before Fajr, is it recommended to pray two rak'ahs before Fajr? Specifically two? Yes, specifically two. To command, to statement. But let's say he prayed two rak'ahs before Fajr and there's no statement. That doesn't negate praying four rak'ahs, it doesn't negate praying six rak'ahs. It doesn't necessarily mean this is a, a strongly recommended sunnah. It may have been a one-off, it may have been done uh, once or twice. So uh, that's significant in usul al-fiqh, distinguishing between words and between actions. This is just a general rule though. It doesn't mean it applies all the time. We have other principles to keep in mind. It could be. Yeah, it could be. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that the Prophet Sallallahu encouraged that we don't really have many narrations supporting that he did it himself. So, um, I'm not saying this is the approach of most ulama, but Imam Malik's approach really is to not specify on a lot of this stuff. So if you were to ask Malik, what's the recommended number of prayers to pray? Voluntary prayers every day. He won't give you a number. Because to him, this is all just variation. The Prophet ﷺ sometimes does this, and sometimes does that, and sometimes does this, sometimes that. It's there to give people flexibility. Some people are more capable of, of praying in the mornings, some in the evenings, some... But, we still do have some numbers. Okay, we spoke about 10 rak'ahs here, 12 rak'ahs, 4 before Asr, we spoke about 4 before Dhuhr and so on. So, the action of the Prophet ﷺ without a statement or without a command could be because of that, not wanting to burden people. It could be because uh, he's sufficing with his action, because his action is also a sunnah. And notice Ibn Umar is talking about, I saw, and he considered that to be a sunnah for himself. Yeah. Do an example of that, for example, be the just distraction, the action, but not necessarily the state. Uh, possibly. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. The Prophet وسلم, when, when he made sujood in the first rak'ah, before standing up, he sat a little bit. Yeah? Called Jalsat al Istiraha. We have many Sahaba describing salah. Most of them don't mention this, the Prophet doing this. So, if we have one or two Sahaba mentioning that he did it, does that imply that it's a consistent sunnah for every prayer? Most ulama say no. 
most ulama are saying. That's why the view of Abu Hanifa and Malik and Imam Ahmad and most of the ulama is that this is what's called Jalsa al Istiraha. Okay, slightly sitting. Do you know what I'm talking about? Made sujood and then he's about to stand up. You can either stand straight up or sit up first and then stand up. That sitting is called Jalsa al Istiraha. Istiraha means rest. It's like he's taking a little, little pause. Uh, you know, the view of Imam Malik and others is that the Prophet ﷺ only did that when he was a little bit older. And that supports what Aisha said, you know, about as he got older, he changed his prayer a little bit. She says, for example, in the night prayer, as he, when he got older, he would sit down and read in Salah. And then when there's about 30 or 15 to 30 verses left, he would stand up, finish reading, and then make a ruku'ah. So age did have an impact on the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ. That this could have been one of those things. Okay, certainly not a strongly recommended sunnah because it's not described in every prayer. And it's because most of the Sahaba don't mention it in the description of the Prophet's prayer, it doesn't seem to be a consistent sunnah. But somebody can do it if they want to, if they need to. That's the view of most ulama. Allah. Yeah. With regards to the, the, the prayer changing I'm not sure, if, I think I've heard this opinion where with the tashakut, with the finger and it moving, um, that some believe that the movement was, the narration was when he was older and that the finger, his finger was moving with older age. Is that, is that something you've heard before? Not heard of, I've not heard of that, but it sounds a bit problematic. Okay. Yeah. Because that, that's if to say that he was moving it unintentionally. Mm. Isn't that what that implies or? Yeah. Or were they or, saying something different? Yeah, I think that's essentially what they were implying. And yeah. They were saying that with, but there weren't many narrations of yeah. his finger moving. Whilst, uh, yeah, and most of the yeah. Sahaba never mentioned that his finger moving. Well, we don't really need this interpretation because the ahadith talking about moving the finger aren't authentic to begin with. So if they're not authentic to begin with, we don't need to, you know, kind of give that kind of answer. Especially if that answer, you know, raises issues. It's not known that the Prophet ﷺ became that weak. His hand was moving without, you know, without his uh, knowledge, uh, and that's why most of the authentic hadith, like you said, don't mention moving to begin with. Allah, yeah. yeah um, has the two sunnas in the before Fajr ever been made um, the level of um, wajib? Like? No, never. And um, any prayer other than the five prayers isn't fav, isn't wajib, and never has been wajib. There's only some discussion on whether the night prayer was wajib on the Prophet ﷺ himself, not on the Ummah, just on him. Some discussion on that. As for any other prayer, no. And, you know, those opinions that say that, uh, you know, it's sinful to leave the Sunnah prayer, or it's sinful to leave the Sunnah before Fajr or Witr even, uh, are problematic opinions. They contradict the well established hadith that say that the obligation is only five prayers. Allah Even if we have some Hanafis with us who might not like that. <laughs> yeah. Tay, uh, final question and then let's see the time. And then I think we'll suffice with that. Yeah. yeah so there's a difference between the actions of the Prophet and his statements. Uh, because actions could be specific to him. But you could say that about statements too, that certain statement, statements could have been specific to the person he was speaking to and that period of time. Has that ever been an issue with any of the uh, topics? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes it's like that. Uh, we have many topics in which the Prophet ﷺ spoke specifically to a person. But we have a general rule. Anything the Prophet says or does is guidance for all of us. Says or does. We're not saying his actions are specific to him. Don't misunderstand this principle. The actions of the Prophet ﷺ are guidance for me and you as well. His words and actions. However, I'm just saying that his words are more explicit. It's easier to say about an action that's specific to the Prophet ﷺ. That's why when we came to his prayer after Asr, we had no problem saying that's specific to him. Why? Because he prohibited his Ummah from praying after Asr. 
So we need a decent way to reconcile. But if he explicitly commanded and said, whoever misses the sunnah after dhuhr should pray after asr, now that's hard to specify now. How are you going to say that's specific to him? Yeah, so uh, there is a slight difference in terms of words and actions. And I'll end with this example of praying when the khatib is giving the khutbah on Friday. It's authentically narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said to somebody, this is in Bukhari, a Muslim, who walked in during the khutbah on Friday. He said, Ya Fulan, asallayta rak'atayn? Did you pray to your rak'as when you walked in? He said, No. He said, Stand up and pray to your rak'as. Some of the fuqaha, like the Malikis and Hanafis, say that was specific to him, that guy. Okay? Why? They say, because you're not supposed to pray during the khutbah. And that in principle is correct. You shouldn't be distracted in the khutbah. If the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا قُلْتَ لِصَاحِبِكَ أَنْصِتْ يَوْمَ الْجُمْعَ وَالْإِمَامُ يَخْتُ فَقَدْ لَغَوْتْ If you say to the person next to you, be quiet, just that, be quiet. Whilst the khatib is speaking, you've transgressed. What's more, praying or saying be quiet? Praying is a lot more. It takes up more time, it's more distracting. Some brothers walk right to the front, okay, and pray in front of the khatib. <laughs> they do, and that's incorrect. That's incorrect. And if you see a gap at the front, pray at the back, two light rakahs, and then, without harming people, because we mentioned last week the hadith of, sit down, you're harming people. Yeah? If you see a clear gap and a clear pathway because people aren't filling the gaps, no problem. Pray to your rakas and then and they'll walk. So in principle it's correct. You shouldn't be disturbed from listening to the khutbah. The problem is, well, it's not a problem, it's just the sharia. The, the problem with this opinion, okay, of saying that it's specific to this man, is that the Prophet ﷺ explicitly said, as narrated by al-Bukhari and Muslim, Whoever comes in whilst the Imam is giving the khutbah should pray to rak'as and keep them brief. Can that be specific? That's general. Okay, that's general. And this wording is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. There's no question marks about its authenticity either. So, uh, that's just another example on that Allah Alam sallallahu alayhi wa nabina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa jama'in and we've, we've gone into some topics that are going to come later okay like the night prayer and, and the khutbah and stuff like that some of these will come later inshallah I understand that it's much better sorry please come understand that no because I mentioned the hadith to sit down the hadith of sit down I said somebody was walking into the masjid okay and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw him stepping over people and he said, sit down, you're harming people. Yeah, sit down. And that's before he, you know, at least apparently, he just entered the masjid. Very unlikely that he prayed, sat down, and then, then stood up. Also, we have explicit general hadith saying that Allah Ta'ala has not obliged more than five daily prayers. If tahiyyat al-masjid which the Sahaba never heard this term, by the way, Tahid al Masjid. We mentioned it later on, Fuqaha later on mentioned it. If we say Tahid al Masjid is wajib, it means that more than five daily prayers are wajib. Because entering the Masjid every day is assumed. Isn't that the assumption for most of the Sahaba? They're going to enter the Masjid every day, at least once. Okay, so. Uh, obligating uh, two rak'ahs before you sit down in the masjid it's not a correct opinion that's why none of the four madahib uh, you know hold, hold that opinion and like I said it, it, it doesn't fit with with the more authentic ahadith Allahu Akbar طيب, final question you're an exception to the rule may I ask a general question? yes I don't think I'll be able to answer that. <laughs> Go on. Uh, is it true that if a kafir makes du'a 
Allah accepted, accepts? Maybe. Yeah. Allah might accept a non-Muslim's dua. Allah accepted Iblis's dua. Yeah. Allah accepted Iblis's dua. Allah Ta'ala when he says that is talking specifically about the dua of the disbelievers to their idols. That's the context of the ayah. And he's, he's talking about uh, uh, what's the beginning of the ayah? Is it قُلِدْ عُلَّدِينَ زَعَمْتُ مِنْ دُونِهِ Anyway, the meaning of the ayah that's just before it is those who you are calling can't hear you or respond to you. Then he said, وَمَا دُعَاءُ الْكَافِرِينَ إِلَّا فِي الْغَلَى And the dua of the disbelievers is far misguided. It's not going to benefit them. In Al-Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal, go to people in Yemen who are from Ahlul Kitab. Are they Muslims or non-Muslims? Non-Muslims. He gave him a list of instructions and he made him judge authority. Then he said to him, وَاتَّقِ دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُونَ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٍ And be careful of the dua of the wrong, the oppressed one. He's saying this in the context of non-Muslims. Okay, be careful of the dua of oppressed ones. Al-Mazlum, can a non-Muslim be oppressed? Yeah. So, this is a, you know, a general hadith that could include any person. Does Allah Ta'ala always accept the dua of the non-Muslim? No. Even a Muslim's dua might not be accepted. But can a non-Muslim's dua be accepted? The answer is yes. And like I said, Iblis's dua was accepted. He asked for Allah to keep him alive until the Day of Judgment. And Allah Ta'ala accepted that for him. What yak? Jazakum Allah khairan. And it's now time for Salat al You got hadith? Yeah,